as to why I have no training. I have no understanding Live what these terms mean. Is on. Um, oh, perfect. Thank you, Ava. Uh, thank you, Ava. Um, and um, actually, Ava, could you uh, could you send us the link to that um, live streaming? It'd be I just want to set it up parallel to this so I can see what it looks uh, like. Okay, absolutely. Wait a second. I won't watch myself the entire time on YouTube, but it just be I just want to see it quickly what it what it looks like. Um, but yeah, I was in, I was just interested to know if anybody kind of when they were reading Frankel, did they really understand what he was saying when they used all these psychoanalytic terms? Because I I didn't. I had to sometimes go online often and see what, what he meant. Yeah, like the very specific uh, uh, stuff. Uh, yeah, I had to look it up. I, I don't think it's, uh, let's say, day-to-day -day, uh, language. Uh, Steve, I checked the uh, YouTube uh, studio backend and it seems that uh, the output link I will receive only once the stream is is done. So because, Hi. you know, the video isn't actually generated yet, right? Uh, ah, I thought it was so a live recording. Ah, it okay. is, it is, but there is some kind of um, delay. Um, so there is no... Um, mm -hmm. I would need to end the stream to get the output link. Don't worry about it. Let's um, let's keep this running because um, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to I don't want to push too much time into the next hour. But this is a good trial session, so we'll see how it looks on YouTube after it ends. Uh, and if, if there's a problem, we'll go back and see how to how to how to fix it. And if there's not, then we know that we just have to wait to the end of the meeting. Maybe yeah, I thought it is a live recording, so it would be good to also um, be able to send a link in the beginning of a meetup to Telegram to other members who may not be able to participate. Um, uh, if they have kids in the background or they're doing something else, maybe they just want to watch it um, uh, from another distance. Ah, um, I, I see your but, point. Um, maybe there is a way to view this right away, but um, wait, what do you get when you, okay. I would send you a link in Telegram. I'm not sure that's the right. Um, maybe you can access my st YouTube studio backend. Uh, I'm not sure. I will send it to you. You can check it out. Uh, wait. What do you see when you click that link? Logging into Telegram, so yes, I have a um, password for everything. So, so YouTube Studio, and no, it asks me to log in. What happens if I log in? So let me just check. Ah, Gonzalo, Gonzalo posted a um. Ah, oh, yeah, sorry. You, you generated uh, the YouTube uh, link from the ID? Yeah, I do some dark magic. And yeah, I got then another link. That should work. That's a, uh, that's a terrible uh, um, photo <laughs> uh, face, face uh, cover of the... Um, of the YouTube link of my face. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Of the YouTube link of my face. 
you heard me there. Yeah, so uh, yeah. there are a few seconds of delay. Yeah, there's a few seconds of delay, but actually it works quite great. So yeah, thank you. How did you do that, by the way? Did um because you weren't the one who set up the YouTube link, so or uh no, but in the URL there was a string that looked like the thing that are after the YouTube videos. So yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So glad to have the web developers on board. <laughs> <laughs> So um, this is streaming. Let's move on to the second part. And so um, Shakam and Eva also posted a few prompts, uh, which I, I really like. I really like the um, uh, these were exactly what I think we should have. Um, I wasn't so sure. So this is good to hear from you guys, because I know it was uh, the other members, uh, Antonio, um, uh, sorry, um, um, uh, Gonzalez, um, Shakam, and Eva, who had proposed we do some kind of second hour segment last time, where we do um, we talk about how we've practiced Stoicism in the past week, um, and I misinterpreted it as being very general. But this was quite these are good prompts because what you're asking is not just a sharing center, but a sharing center of how we have experienced or practiced Stoicism in the past week in relation to the topic. And so I think that was, now I understand exactly what you mean, and that makes total sense. And especially with local therapy, that um, we can even do this next week. And so um, uh, next week, we don't have to have a sharing center for that topic. We can maybe, um, as this is just a trial, we can talk about this in Telegram and say, hey, everybody, focus on local therapy's um, uh, role and practice in your own life and experiences for the next week. And then bring back your bring back your experiences and reflections next week and see how you've applied local therapy to to your own life um that's perfect that's exact that's exactly what we need um i guess we can start off with some of the questions you guys posed um you've asked us how do you apply local therapy concepts to your personal life so this doesn't have to be from past experience this could also be from personal experience how you've applied other stoic practices in your life that may align with the local therapy, for which areas of your lives local therapy doesn't make sense and why. Now, let's start with the first one, because I think that's more basic. How do you apply local therapy concepts to your personal lives? And I guess just to run down maybe a quick list of concepts we've already talked about, and so that we're not lost, maybe we have um, a short list of concepts I'll write down right now. So this includes, uh, Perhaps uh, some of the concepts don't have names, right? Some of the concepts don't have names. Um, but perhaps one way of one version we can talk of is meaning, right? Um, meaning and a will to meaning. Another concept is something Luisa brought up in the very beginning. Um, she was referring to this kind of um, causing your decisions and reactions backwards from time. And so basically reminding yourself of the finiteness and finality of life. Um, another logotherapeutic concept could be as we were just talking about maybe humanism or human agency. Um, human agency, especially uh, especially in regards to um, decision-making and making your own meaning. And perhaps experiences experiences um uh, i mean this is what we're asking for but specifically experiences how victor frankl understood it um uh, in regards to using experiences to then create your own meaning or to um find meaning or to come out of your own ego as frankl was saying that um you need to not look inward to find meaning, you need to look outward. He actually, I think, used the word altruistic. 
you need to act and experience something altruistic in order to find meaning. Um, because you need to, as he called it, not be, um, I forget the word he used, um, to find meaning, you don't use self-inspection, you use self-transcendentalism. You need to transcend yourself and experience other things and people in order to find meaning. I think those are some of the major local therapeutic concepts. There are, I think, others, but I, I can't think of like one word names for them. So meaning, reminding of the finiteness and finality of life, human agency, and experiences in the, in, in the context of meaning making. Um, so in regards to some of these local therapeutic concepts, how do you apply local therapy to your own personal lives? Um, Oh, I was going to start, but Tobias, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I like, I mean, I I guess uh, I will try more, but uh, I like this practice of, yeah, looking at a difficult situation or at the suffering that I may be experiencing and then thinking about uh, what positive consequences this can have uh, or maybe on other people or... or um, maybe on me later on. I think I'm just, you know, uh, as, a, as a parent, there, there's a lot of challenging situations that you have to go through. And I don't know, at the moment, we're not getting so much sleep and, and, and it's, it's very challenging. But then I can think about how this, how if I can endure this and go through this uh, with uh, strength and dignity and um, keep my patience and stuff. So this will be uh, having a very good effect on my kids later on. So, so I think that's a, that's a very good concept to keep in mind. Like also what, what is the suffering for and what is the meaning of this and what good effects can also come out of them? Yeah, um, I would like to add, like, um, it's also like a, a nice thing to remember, right? That suffering and bad times, it's part of the human condition and that everyone uh, uh, has to go through that because, yeah, as I said, it's part of the human condition and uh, it gives a good spirit to... Uh, uh, Franka gives a good spirit to these personal experiences that everyone shares. So, um, first of all, Tobias, that's um, I found that um, charming. The suffering you go through raising children, um, I can uh, I, I teach, so I, I go through a little bit of suffering as well. I don't have kids of my own. Um, but, uh, at least I'm studying this now so I can endure what may be ahead. <laughs> so, um, and I think the optimism, yeah, I think the optimism, and I think Ava, Ava was talking about this specifically, the optimism and another concept, um, in Viktor Frankl, in how he endures human suffering, um, is exactly what you need to endure that. I mean, you go through human suffering, but in order to endure it, you don't just have this feeling of, um, and I don't think, I actually don't like the word optimism. I think he uses optimism, um, but um, I don't think he spends too much time on the future as much as we think. I, and, and again, I'll recall this story with he thinking of his wife. Um, like I wouldn't, um, in a situation of human suffering, think about the delicious dinner I'm going to have later. Like that, that, that is not um, a way to endure suffering. And I don't think that he, he would agree with that either um, because you're looking into a future that you shouldn't be looking into yet because it doesn't really matter. Um, I think in these cases about human suffering, I think also Tobias said um, to use this virtue, maybe absent from stoicism, this virtue of patience, um, but, um, and I, I don't like the word optimism because optimism kind of feels like you're talking about, um, I see your hand, Louisa, and, um, uh, it kind of feels like you're talking about looking into the future to, um, uh, to kind of distract yourself from the human suffering you're going through now. 
um, where I think what he's doing when he thinks about his wife is more abstract. It's reassuring oneself of one's values and one's meaning in life rather than thinking ahead and kind of trying to escape the suffering you're going through now. I think there's a small difference. Um, and I think, I think he would agree in the sense that you shouldn't try and um, like in Tobias's case, think of that delicious dinner you're going to eat later to endure the suffering of your kids. Um, this, Louisa. Uh, yeah. I do not think that suffering is good. Mind you, I was brought up as a Catholic, even if I've left the church, so I should think that suffering is good. I don't think Suffering is good, I just think that suffering is. And um, I would like to have a very unprofessional language to express how I feel. Um, I totally agree on the point about one, what one is learning for his children, several other points, sum it all up. Shit happens, you might as well use it to fertilize something because it's there, you know. One of the things that most helps, for example, one of the things that have, has most helped me raising children is remembering how it feels to be in a situation. Uh, not, not only bad situations, also good ones, but I mean, the children uh, like to share their joy, but they like to, to be there uh, even more when something, they're suffering for some reason, okay? So the experience, as Franco implies, is what lets you, for example, develop empathy. As uh, My training is in psychology, not in, in philosophy. Uh, children don't seem to develop um, the, uh, the skill of empathy until they're, you know, an average of six years old because they haven't lived. It's not only the neurons. It's just that they have to go through the experiences and then they can really uh, use it, included the so-called shit that happens. Um, Frankel is very much on that line, I feel. One last thing, real quick, since I will have to go pretty soon. Um, okay, meaning, Let's go practical again. Uh, I have come to feel, feel, not think at my point in my life, that life has no meaning except the meaning you give it. And I've looked into a number of things like talents or limits I was uh, born with, things that I've always liked or loved and things that I stayed away of as a patrimony that I was giving that would point to what meaning I could give on my life. Okay, life has no meaning to me, it means we're on this planet. We don't know why. We don't know where we're going. We, you know, we're dropped into life, as an existentialist would say. And so maybe we just help rolling the planet along without even know why, knowing why. In my case, the meaning comes from knowing what it is to live, through experiences in life and experiences with others 
and then use whatever you were given at birth uh, to act on the planet in an empowered way. Last thing, to me, empowerment is the basic difference between the Stoics and Franca. Because when you say, shit is going to happen to you, what counts is the freedom you have to decide how you react to it, then you're not a passive victim. You have choice. Even if fate put things in your way. Okay, that's it. You can go ahead, Chacon. Uh, no, it's it's fine, fine. Go ahead. Um, but yeah, um, thanks you, Louisa, for that. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. I think we focus on human suffering as a concept, but we don't do enough to say actually it's it's bad when you suffer. What's what you have to understand, or or it's nothing you can stop. Um, and that's exactly I like I wrote it down like, by quote: "Shit happens, you might as well fertilize it to do something." Um, and it's also paradigmatic of stoicism as well as Victor Frankl that these shit that will happen to you this human suffering is something that you can't control that is not just something that you can't control it's something that is inevitable it's like the development of a human child that they're going to go through the only way in which they learn is to go through circumstances that are uncomfortable for them and whether or not they're whether or not they, you can control for it parents children can't control those factors is that they're going to have to develop ways in which to deal with those situations um, and that, that's exactly what um, Frankl does during his experiences in the concentration camp. His experiences is something that helps him to learn. Um, he, uh, and he's almost like a child in these camps. Actually, when you said child, it makes me think that he's, he was almost like a child when he was in those camps because he didn't have any basis for understanding how to cope with those realities. Um, and that was something he had to learn after a long period of time. Um, and he, but mm, it's um, this idea of empathy. Um, Shikham, you can go. I don't have my thoughts down right now. I wanted to make comment on comment on um, humans developing empathy, but I can maybe save that for later when I have my thought processed. Yeah, about about that. Um, I asked here last week if you really have to experience these experiences yourself in order to be prepared for the, for them, uh, in order to to feel empathy. And of course, it it won't be the same. But I think reading about it um, helps me uh, prepare and develop the empathy, although I wasn't myself uh, in a concentration camp or I didn't suffer this this way. Um, and of course, reading about it, it's not the same, but it can also widen a uh, my understanding so yeah these small kids uh, can't know what's uh, going on uh, in uh, uh, the other person's uh, mind uh, okay nobody can know but yeah they didn't experience uh, these things and they don't have the tools to understand or to imagine uh, what uh, what can be um all right hmm. i think um i think that was um that was Luisa's time to go i, I guess um but um yeah you, you made me think of um uh, there is reset to understand it but there is like say an educational research um 
there is an understanding that in learning theory, you can learn things vicariously. Um, like you have to practice to get better. But I remember this um, this this um, popular learning theory text for edu for education um, students that they talk about this idea of um, where they open up the the chapter on um, a tennis player and a tennis coach, and the tennis coach is showing her how to correct her mistake by doing it herself, and so the the learner observes her and. By, and vicariously, she learns how to do it. She, she learns the correct technique from her coach and then applies it herself. Um, and I mean, that's probably more of a direct experiential version of what we're talking about when I say vicariously. But I think the point is made that I think even reading a book, um, like we wouldn't be talking about this right now and how to apply it in our lives if um, vicarious learning didn't work at all. I think to an extent, we shouldn't be expected to go through what Viktor Frankl did just to come to the same realizations and philosophies that he did. That would be absurd. I think you're right. I think, you know, to an extent experience matters, but to an extent um, you need to learn things vicariously. That's why we have edu education systems, we have schools, we have places for students to go learn, to go out into nature, to, um, to learn from their parents, to watch television shows and listen to podcasts and things like that, because you know they learn from those those media as well. Um, I think I think that's why we're here too. I mean, that's why I would say I'm here. It's not just the philosophy that interests me, because we're all interested in how to apply it to endure. Um, and I think that that's that's exactly the point of logotherapy is to endure. How do you endure, but also how do you find meaning? I think it's endurance and meaning that really are the coupled concepts that underpin it. And I think would underpin a kind of stoicism plus philosophy too. Um, it's not just the virtues. Uh, the virtues, I don't know. I think this is um, just, go, sorry, going back to the theory. I think this is maybe a way that Frank Franco would depart from stoicism. Uh, I wouldn't practice following the virtues. I would, the point of philosophy would be to, or the point of being for me would be to, I would try and experience and strive for meaning um, by applying those virtues. Virtues are kind of just like a tool in order to find, maybe to find meaning. Um, I'm not sure if they intersect as well as I'm talking about. I think there are two completely different concepts actually, to an extent. Um, but um, I think, I would be able to, yeah, I think so. I think in summary, I think I would use the virtues the Stoics gave us in order to find meaning and in experience, learn and prepare for the situations of human suffering to endure. Um, I think I would invert it. I don't think I, the, the Stoics placed, I think, too much priority on the virtues being the end goal. But I like Fran Frankl's substitution of that for meaning. I think that's what that's what I would always strive for. I would never strive to be wise i would strive to maybe um find and achieve meaning um by being wise as wise as i can be mm -hmm. oh, yeah go ahead um yeah i'm trying to think um and like build um i say like a, like a timeline of actions and reactions um, and to combine logotherapy and stoicism. Um, because uh, I feel, I'll say, you can't be really driven by the virtues these are more like helpful guides um, to help you uh, choose the right the right thing when there's a situation and you're you have a choice to uh, act with or through uh, temperance act with or through wisdom um, so when there's a fork in the road the virtues can guide you, but they can't tell you 
what's the destination? There's no like perfectly wise a uh, person that you can emulate or try to be. It's not a destination. It can't be a destination. Um, it's just a perfect abstraction of an idea. So I think um, with striving for meaning and goals, um, the um, logotherapy can, can give us a destination. In stoicism, I don't know, filling your role in society, uh, living according to fate, it's not really a destination. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I wanted to point out, so I, wa I wanted to move to another tactic I'm thinking of that um, uh, specifically about practice. Um, well, I, I do agree completely with, with the idea that um, achieving virtues is not something, as you said, it's not motivating. Like, I don't want to, I don't live life and say, I'm going to be the wisest person I can be. Just, um, actually seems a little bit silly. Um, I want to I want to try and achieve what I think is meaningful for me in life. That to me is very motivational. If I think that, um, you know, connecting with more Stoics gives me meaning and being loving to my family and friends is, gives me meaning, then that is, that to me is, you know, a, a good enough meaning for me personally. And I want to achieve that. I want to continue striving for that, but I would use being a wise person, being courageous enough to go ahead and do that, being just in my decisions, being tempered to take those steps. Those are all things or tactics you would use. Um, and I, I was just thinking about um, another typical stoic technique. So Marcus, or this is a, a contrast I'm thinking of, just kind of step forward into the next area of practice, that it's interesting I, I keep coming back to that example of his wife, that Stoics, especially Marcus Aurelius, would maybe favor a negative visualization. They often basically use um, negative visualization tools to um, prepare for what's ahead. And I do, I do agree that that's a useful tool, negative visualization. But it's interesting, Victor Franco actually uses the opposite. I don't think he uses negative visualization. He uses positive visualization. He uses the complete opposite technique. Um, Marcus Aurelius would often think about death and think about the worst things that would happen during a day. Think about all the stupid, poor, terrible people he would meet in a day. Whereas Victor Franco uses positive visualization to endure human suffering. That, um, uh, I don't think he 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 takes care to prepare for it. I don't think he focuses so much on like the Stoics do on preparation for human suffering. I think he basically provides tools and techniques to endure human suffering as it comes to happen to you. Um, I think the best way maybe he would argue to prepare for it is to prepare, you know, practice those techniques like positive visualization. And then when human suffering comes and you can identify it, start practicing positive visualization. But it's interesting that they use very different techniques in order to endure this human suffering. Um, yeah, just to know, I was just thinking about that same, that one story about thinking of his wife sticks with me because I feel like that's the start of his understanding of, when I read that, that was the start of his understanding of the will to meaning, this whole foundation for his philosophy and psychoanalysis, and it's complete opposite what Stoics would have you do. Yeah, that's that's really say what I want to say. Yeah, in 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 your uh, stoicism plus, uh, I think some of um, Frankel's uh, ideas can supplement uh, or like even replace a kind of archaic um, stoic uh, ideas. 
Um, uh, do, do we, uh, go ahead. Yeah, maybe it can be a nice combination. I think I also read somewhere like a quote, like we we strive for the best, but we ex we expect the worst or something like that. So maybe it's a good <laughs> combination of both. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, Stoics would uh, do more of expecting the worst um, and less preparing uh, for the best. Um, yeah. So the, the um, see the thing I wanted uh, to bring uh, to the second part um, was about. Um, the piece from the bottom of the soup um, uh, pot. Uh, just these um, small acts of uh, kindness. Um, should we wait for Steve? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, yeah. So Frankel uh, talks about how prisoners showed uh, each other, uh, um, let's say, like small deeds um, of kindness um, and how much happiness uh, it brought. Um, just having extra like two two pieces uh, inside uh, your watery um not very nourishing uh, soup and it's not about a uh, suffering and it's not focusing on the bad bad parts um in the human existence i think and, and and the Stoics have like nothing like this, as far as I can tell. But actively making the world better in very small ways, um, even if existence is not as dreary and as horrible as con as the concentration camps, people are having bad days, and. An extra pea in the soup can really make their day. But what what is the stoic approach to suffering? Um, because I mean, sometimes uh, it's also self and self inflicted suffering to is it, is it kind of a training for the hard times, or um, so that you just get yourself strong to endure the suffering? Or I mean. It's more of a discomfort than suffering. I mean, there are some, I say, interpretations of uh, Christianity and uh, Islam where they, like, self, um, uh, how it's called, um, like, they wipe themselves and uh, um, to to inflict uh, suffering and to prepare themselves for heaven. The Stoics have nothing like that. Um, I think it was more um, preparing to live without the luxuries, like 
uh, Seneca was one of the wealthiest people in Rome at that time, uh, but he practiced uh, wearing um, like a, a coarse uh, clothing and eating uh, just, you know, the very basic uh, foods. Although he could have worn uh, silk and ate uh, huge feasts, um, he chose to sometimes practice uh, discomfort. And so it's not suffering. He didn't starve himself. He, he didn't freeze uh, in cold winter nights. I don't think, I haven't seen any stoic uh, anecdote or uh, anything about inflicting self-suffering. Hmm. Um, it reminds me of Epictetus, actually, because he um, he learned Stoicism in the same way, similar to Viktor Frankl. I mean, their situations are vastly different, but Epictetus was, in some sense, a slave. And um, I mean, obviously, it was not the kind of slavery that Viktor Frankl endured, but it was still slavery. He was still owned. He was still forced to labor. And it was... Um, uh, he found solace in going to these lectures by Zeno. He just, he took these lectures and he said that um, this is kind of a good reprieve from uh, the human suffering he had to endure otherwise. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, uh, human suffering is ever, um, uh, should be advocated for. Um, but it's something that, something that I think sometimes is self-inflicted though. Uh, I would only, I'll, 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 I would only disagree in very extreme circumstances. Like I think a, a famous example would be uh, Gandhi and the Indian independence movement that um, this, and in fact, some Indians do that today um, where they still practice um, starvation for weeks or periods of week, a, a time that um, in order to, stage an activist uh, an, an activist message to stage a protest um and i think but only in very extreme circumstances that's the only case i could think of where you would actually endure such human suffering um and you would endure it because you want to be closer to other humans you want to do this for your for the people you want to do this for a cause and this is a meaning for them so i think i think it's not unaligned with Viktor Frankl's local therapy. I think that practice, because they found meaning in supporting their cause and fighting for their cause, that they found it a useful tactic. But again, I think that's an extreme circumstance. But I think the first thought I had was Epictetus and um, uh, the similarity with him um, taking these lectures as kind of a, a good positive experience as distraction from human suffering. Um Yeah, I think we should have a meetup about um, the stoic suicide. Um, Seneca uh, killed himself. Uh, and I think I found some places uh, that talk, uh, how say, favor, favor favorably about uh, Socrates' uh, suicide. Um, and I think there are some lines that saw the absolute truth or and the, the duty as values that are above the personal life. Um, I, I, can, I can look uh, deeper into it, but... Um, but yeah, I think it's something that we can talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will put that down because I think we often talk about the practices of Stoicism. And maybe in these circumstances, we should also talk about the limits. Like how far would you realistically go? I mean, I mean, I think logotherapy would allow for these kinds of things um, in, in theoretically, uh, because you make your own meaning 
you fight for your values. And if it's, this is a appropriate tactic you would want to use, I think Socrates would say the same thing. But mm, I think there are limits. I think there are, um, and I think that, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying there are, and I can't say there are, but I'm saying this is a good topic for the future. Like we should look into um, these extreme examples of fighting or dying for your cause and understanding like the example of maybe we can use that as a whole theme, suicide of the Stoic um, to, uh, um, to examine this. I, I also remember that fact that Seneca used, he was thinking of um, uh, Socrates when he was committing suicide. Um, he was thinking of that same image. I think, I think story told story tells that it took Seneca a couple of tries to finally die. I don't, I forget. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's horrible. Um, it's horrible. We, don't, uh, don't read it again. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, that is human suffering. I don't think, uh, anybody could prepare for, um, but, um, Yeah, but that that was a conscious decision he made because he. It, I remember the story. They they like friends of his, or or, or not. I guess in a weird way, ironically, friends of his uh, or colleagues of his stormed into his office and said, "You must commit suicide. This is Nero wants this. You have to do this. This is you. You have to go." And so they gave him that choice. They weren't going to kill him. They weren't going to execute him. They were going to ask him to commit suicide or be exiled. So that was a conscious decision, and it's interesting. It would be interesting to examine if that is um, an appropriate Stoic act, and in, in what sense, and in what case, and um, perhaps, perhaps that's a good example of evidence that Stoics do believe there is a sense of meaning above the human individual, that there is a sense of um, uh, not loyalty. I don't want to use that word. Um, but a, a feeling of responsibility, that's responsibleness. That's what Viktor Franco was using, responsibility to a cause or meaning. And uh, maybe, maybe Stoics have a little bit more of that than, than I had been thinking before when I said there is an absence of meaning in their philosophy. Maybe that is in their suicides. That's, that's how you can find their idea of meaning to a cause as something actually pretty, pretty important in their philosophy, or at least in their actions as, as, as being practiced, practitioners of philosophers. Yeah, I thought um, that uh, uh, Donald Robertson um, uh, cognitive behavioral th therapy can be a good um, follow up to uh, to the logotherapy. Um, because uh, this uh, school of thought is, um, how say, directly um, quoting from the Stoics. Um, we can find a lot of uh, parallels uh, between logotherapy and, and Stoicism, um, but I don't think there is like a, um, a very direct connection, um, but with um, a, a C CBT, there is an actual uh, connection and like very strong one. Um, so this is one of the most practical stoic um, like psych, um, psycho, psychology, psychology schools of, of thought uh, that there is uh, today. So I don't know if, if we want it to be uh, next week or... Actually, that's exactly what I was thinking, is doing, following this up, as we had planned, actually, a, a session on CBT. And we can do a couple. Maybe we can do a session on CBT. Uh, and specifically... Um, I, have, I would have to do this quick today um, for next Saturday uh, if we do it on a Saturday. Um, yeah, we would have to plan because the sharing center, the second part of that, um, we would have to plan and ask people, uh, participants on Telegram and Meetup 
and to um to very much focus on the practice of of cognitive behavioral therapeutic um, methods in their lives and experiences over the next week. Maybe we can hear much more. Um, I think that's that's that that's the supplement we needed to the Sherry Center. It was giving giving a word of not a caution, but a, a forewarning to people to make sure to implement this or see or notice this in your own lives so that we can actually share experiences the next time around. Um, because I think that would be much more fruitful. I don't know of any texts. Does anybody know of any? So we're just looking to the future now, looking to next week. Does anybody know of any basic texts or resources we could use to look into cognitive behavioral therapy and its connections to stoicism? Yeah, I, I can send a... Uh... Um, I have a couple. That'd be perfect. Uh, yeah. I, I bought uh, the book, but I don't know how, if um, if I can share it. Um, Amazon is very defensive about sharing files. Yeah, I, I look for a PDF of of this book. Share us the um, if you can't share us the um, uh, link and um, not the link, but the title and the information anyway. Um, but if you can find a PDF, that'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, um, and that's all I have for you guys. I, I'm going to bounce off because in a few minutes, I'm going to log on to another meetup I have at six o'clock. Um, and Shikham and Ava, I especially invite you if you, if you are welcome to join, because I know you guys are putting a little bit more time as well into preparing for these meetups. Um, I just want to limit it to that because I don't know how much I am allowed to invite outside of who they are invited by email. And so I don't want to start inviting too many people when there might be a threshold on Zoom. But um, in any case, uh, you two are invited. So I put the I put the link in the Telegram chat. Um, in any case, um, unless you guys have any last comments, it was great to see everybody. Tobias, Gonzalez, Eva, Shakam, thank you for thank you for joining. And this was a really good. Um, thank you, Shakam. Um, uh, this is a really good session. I like this format. Um, was did anybody? How did everybody feel about this? Like we started out with certain prompts, uh, and we asked some specific questions, some specific relations between the text and stoicism. But did anybody feel like there was something missing, or there was something um, that could have been changed in the way we presented the material? No, it was. Was fine, I think. It sounds like it went went, went, well, went well. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks, everybody. I will see you next Saturday then. Saturday, I'll make the meeting again. So. Okay. Awesome, guys. Thank you. Have a good week, everybody. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye.